guess we'll see as we go along. So, just a couple of applications. 
Um, and this slide shows some examples of how, on the other side of things, liquid crystal can be used to modify the arrangement of nanoparticles. So the first slide was about um, nanoparticles going into the phase and changing its properties. This slide is about how we can put the nanoparticles in liquid crystal and we can arrange the nanoparticles and maybe move them around using the liquid crystal medium. Because it's a switchable medium, we apply electric field or magnetic field to phase, we can move all the molecules so you can potentially move nanoparticles if they have a certain structure within the phase. So a couple of things that have been done here, just to give some ideas, are uh, this is one project from our lab where we use a disc-shaped uh, gallium arsenide nanoparticle from stacks, and then these stacks can be moved around by switching the liquid crystal. This is another application, um, this is a more of a spherical nanoparticle from chains that can also be moved by switching the crystal device. And of course, there are all other different kind of nanostructures like nanorods or carbon nanotubes. And this is one example of aligning nanotubes within the matter phase. People have looked at try to disperse and switch different kind of nanorods or nanoparticles. So that's another side of things. Um, oh, and there's a good review article here that uh, Torsten sent me that you might be interested in to do with uh, putting carbon dots and nanoparticles in the Okay, so some of the effects that we can get. Um, let's just think about <coughs> nanoparticles, what are they, and um, you know what they can do. So there's a lot of different ones that you might come across. Um, I'm particularly interested in quantum dots because of their emission properties. Um, here I got a couple of pictures here. I think these pictures are just so amazing, particularly this one. Like this is a TEM image of, of silver nanoparticle. Like we can really see the atom lattice. It's like so amazing. <laughs> so this is from one recent paper. Um, this one, I don't know if we're going to see it this well. This is a quantum dot. Um, I don't know if I can make it darker in here. Well, maybe just take a word for it. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> But you know, if you really look closely, you can see the rows of atoms as well in this quantum dot. It's the main point I wanted to make. I guess this one shows it really well. Let's pick this up. A little trim. Okay, so basically, nanoparticle has a very small size, less than 100 nanometers. I think it can qualify. Most of the things that we're looking at are just a few nanometers, say 5 to 10 nanometers in size. So we're getting down to particles that are of the order of the size of the liquid crystal molecule, um, but not so small that they're going to ignore the liquid crystal. You know, if you went down to less than a nanometer, then you know, they may not interact with the director. But um, they're definitely very much smaller than optical wavelengths. Like, we're not going to be able to see them, but we can see optical effects that result from their <coughs> arrangement or assembly. It can be metallic, so there's lots of work going on in gold particles, silver particles, making different shapes and functional structures that can be put into liquid crystal. Semiconducting, there's been some work. This could be uh, maybe cat selenide. Um, quite often it's a core shell structure. So in this particle, even though in the dark part, that would be the core, we can't see the individual atoms. But this section is the core, and then there's a shell of, um, on the outside here, of the zinc sulfide, so you can just see it here. And they usually put the shell on to help stabilize the particles. So you can purchase uh, particles of different structures quite easily commercially if you're interested in working in this field. And then the gallium arsenide, that was the disc shaped particles that we looked at, um, that was synthesized in the um, Dave Kelly's lab at UC Reset. It's nice if you can work with some groups that are able to either synthesize particles or modify the surface property, but there's still quite a lot of particles available commercially if you're interested in doing this. Um, okay, so we could use a surface ligand or a shell to help stabilize the particle. 
<coughs> and that can also change their optical properties as well. Okay, so, just a couple of uh, examples here from papers. Okay. So, seeing as we're talking primarily about quantum dots, I thought I would introduce a little reminder to you of a solid state physics class, just to see if you can remember. Sometimes I have to remind myself too of all this basic stuff. So, when we're talking about the quantum dot, it's basically a very small crystal semiconductor. Okay. But because it is so small, it doesn't behave like a bulk semiconductor. You know, in the semiconductor, think about the band gap and um, the gap energy and so on. But in the quantum dot, because it is so small, it modifies the band structure of the system. And that's why we can get a very specific emissions from quantum dots. You're probably most familiar with the idea of the quantum dot as being something where you excite and it will give out a specific color, a specific wavelength. So that's because of its very small size. And we can understand that a little better if we think about the semiconductor physics. So this will represent the kinetic energy of a box semiconductor if we just think about free electrons. So I guess more like a metal. When we go to the semiconductor though, we're going to have some kind of different behavior. Okay, so this would be the dispersion relation for the free electron model. In the free electron model, we ignore the lattice of the material. Okay, so electrons can just move around randomly. And you can see it's a parabola. So what it looks like. Okay, but you know, in all materials we'll have a band gap. It's just some of them will not have a band gap in the such a regime that makes it a semiconductor. Um, but the band gap is coming from the fact that in the real semiconductor we have the lattice underlying the structure. So the electrons cannot take certain energies in this gap. Okay. Um, so we can have this called the Nearly Free Electron Model. Okay. And when uh, this has this interaction with the periodic crystal potential, we open up the band gap, the electrons can't have certain energies in this range. You can think of this a little bit like also in the photonic crystal with certain wavelengths will propagate. It's analogous to that. And it's also analogous to the stuff I'll be talking about in the next slide about the fluid photonic crystal. Okay, so in the bulk semiconductor, we get this band gap. Now, in the quantum dot, this is the same material, right? But it's a very small piece. So if we compare the two, it's like saying that the quantum dot is a little bit like uh, the example of the particle in a box. So you remember solving the solution for 1D particle in a box, maybe the 3D particle in a box. Um, we can see that instead of having the band, continuous energy band of the box semiconductor, we're going to end up with more discrete energy levels. Okay, so we could represent them maybe here for our 1D solution. Um, when we shine light on the quantum dot, we generate the exciton, okay, which is an um, electron hole pair, and we're going to combine that spatially within the material. Um, there's only certain energy that we can take. Now, very high up. Then when you go smaller, you get discrete energy levels, and the smaller the quantum dot will be, the greater the energy gap. Okay, so then you go between different colors, go from red to green to blue. Okay. So then we can generate a whole range of different colors of quantum dot just based on the size effect. So the size effect is really important in these materials. And Quantum dots have been used in a whole range of applications now. It's a very popular kind of dye or emitter. In biology, it's been used all the time. Functionalized quantum dots can be put into uh, biological cells or labels to target certain molecules to light up different biological structures. 
They're also used a great deal in different optoelectronic electronic devices and so on. So it's a, it's a big field, a big industry producing quantum dots. Um, and okay, so the one other point here is that we can, by changing the size, you know, changing the energy structure. So even though the bulk semiconductor will have a certain gap. And emission, like maybe silicon is giving 1.1 EV. Uh, if you take that material and just make it smaller and smaller, you can have different emissions. So cat selenide has a bulk gap of 714, but if we make quantum dots from it, they can emit anywhere between 450, which will be really blue, up to 630 or even more, just by changing the size. So it's a really tunable material. This equation is just telling us you know, what the, it's approximation, but what the energy should be of the emission compared to the bulk. So this is the size of the particle. Ah, okay. So quantum dots are an emitter and they are highly tunable. Okay. If we wanted to make an application where we put them as part of the material, then we'll have a tunable emitter embedded in the material. So that could be interesting. Okay. So, so far I was just thinking about single quantum dots. But one interesting thing about putting quantum dots into a material is we can kind of control what they do. So maybe they can cluster together and they can be dispersed. If they are well dispersed, they should have the properties of the individual quantum dots. But if we could get them to cluster or make a coating where they have a certain spacing, or maybe even pack into a lattice, <coughs> then we can get some more like, emergent collective behavior coming out of it. And that could also be really interesting for applications. So some examples of how clustering can give uh, different effects are plasma resonance in gold particles. So if we have lots of gold particles together, we can observe plasma resonance. And here we can see one actually we measured in our lab there's some gold nanoparticles. Superparamagnetism, that's an effect where we can have a paramagnetic-like system when magnetic nanoparticles cluster together. So that could occur at room temperature. And the other one down here, which I think is quite interesting too, is this foster resonance energy transfer. This is an effect between semiconducting particles like the quantum dots. So if one quantum dot absorbs the photon, so it would be excited, and then it could decay and produce an emission. Or, it could be an energy transfer between this one and a nearby quantum dot, say from blue, will emit, absorb in a blue, emit a lower energy photon, which will then immediately be absorbed by a nearby quantum dot. Okay, so without emitting first. So that's the foster resonance energy transfer. Uh, this effect is actually used a lot with dyes in biology and fluorescent microscopy. If you have two complementary dyes of slightly different uh, absorptions, you put them very close to each other, then one will transfer its energy to the other, and then it will emit a say, lower energy. So that effect is used all the time to detect if two molecules are very close to each other. Like say if you wanted to know if one molecule is binding to another, you can use breath. But the same effect can be seen in quantum dots as well. We've been able to detect some of those effects. Okay, so we can have particles separate or we can have them in a cluster. Um, oh, another effect that I didn't mention is also the, oh, what is it, the metal-induced fluorescence as well. So a metal nanoparticle next to a quantum dot will enhance its fluorescence as well. That's used quite a bit in you know, some applications. So we can have different effects when we cluster different types of particles together, metal, magnetic, um, conductor. they interact with each other. We create some physical effects that we can measure. Actually, controlling the assembly of interacting nanoparticles is a really important goal in material science because we have all these effects between particles that we wouldn't see in the bulk system. But 
trying to get the particles to pack together in a controlled way is actually really hard. So you could do a kind of bottom-up approach where you physically try to grow them in a lattice or place them down. Okay, that's one way that we can do it. But that would produce a very small amount of material. The other way that we can try to approach a problem is to try to sell the sample in a fluid state. So say we have a phase or a solution which will help us to bring the particles together in a controlled fashion. That might produce larger amounts of the material that could be used for, say, a coating or a hard material for an optical application. So that's one of the goals right now. Um, and maybe something that you might be interested in working on. So before we can make this kind of hybrid material of a lattice of different types of particles, maybe you could imagine semiconductor gold, semiconductor gold, you know, in a, in a lattice. It's actually really hard. You first have to understand how they can behave in solution. What will they do before we can try to get them to group together? Okay. Um, we could maybe lead to new materials for coating, switchable devices, controllable dielectric materials, and you know, all kinds of exotic things like uh, matter materials, negative refractive index, you have all this coating device, applications, all kinds of futuristic things that we might be able to make. If we can really control the particle one by one into an assembly. Okay. And so some of the goals to be linking pairs together, then you could have controllable threat with certain spacing, making a lattice, and even so dispersing the liquid crystal in a very controlled way. A couple of groups right now working on ideas where we can attach the liquid crystal molecule to the surface of the particle for dispersion or you know, try to link them together. So it's a very interesting too. <coughs> So, before I talk any more about this application, let's just go right back to the basics. Okay, so, we want to disperse a nanoparticle in liquid crystal. So, you have an idea of an experiment. I'm going to get some nanoparticles and I'm going to put them in liquid crystal. It's going to be really interesting. You have to think about well, what exactly is going to happen here? Is it going to work? What are they going to do? Because the nanoparticle is not just this hard piece of semiconductor. It has a surface. And this is really like trying to dissolve something. When a nanoparticle is very small, okay, once you try to incorporate it into the liquid crystal, but its surface property is going to fight against you. Okay. Look at this typical nematic phase. So we have all these carbon chains on the end of the molecules. And we're going to put this particle into here. Think about, well, what is actually going to happen here? Is that going to be favorable to put this thing into the phase? And so, before you would attempt such an experiment, you should think that surface properties are the most important thing you need to think about. Okay, I showed you those pictures of the nanoparticles before. Look just like the semiconductor crystal and nothing else. <coughs> but most commercial nanoparticles or particles that you'll get from a chemist that's helping you out your research will have something on the surface. They'll have ligands. And the surface ligands will interact with the liquid crystal molecules um, and they're going to modify how those molecules arrange themselves. So let's say I put a particle into my pneumatic phase here and the particle is covered with the same kind of carbon chains coming out of these liquid crystal molecules, you're probably going to get something like this happening. Okay. Let's say we've got some oleic acid on the surface, this kind of molecule. Well, when you look at the interaction between these two carbon chains, the one from the molecule and one from the nanoparticle, you can pretty clearly see that this liquid crystal is not going to want to lie parallel with the particle, and you're going to get some kind of preferred orientation. So you can see the molecules lining up around the outside of the particle to creating a defect, which is hedgehog defect. Okay. Um, the type of ligand on the surface of the particle is going to determine the anchoring effect of the crystal. So that's going to be very important. In the case 
case of particle with like acid in 5CB. Okay, we're going to get something like this happening. Okay, on first pass, that's what you think might happen. However, it's not necessarily going to be the only thing that happens. But this is one thing that can happen. Um, just another diagram demonstrating kind of surface. Also, these ligands can increase the size of the particle quite a bit um, by a couple of nanometers inside of these. So the type of ligand on the surface really controls the anchoring effects of how the liquid crystal will orient around the particle. Another point here is the small scale of the nanoparticle makes this interaction particularly important. Okay. In the large colloid, yes? Yes. So. I'm really wondering, you said uh, most, most of commercial nanoparticles are uh, coated with uh, the surface lesion. So is there any special lesion? Any special what? Is there any special lesion the manufacturer the coat the surface with uh, this? Uh, well, uh, part of the synthesis process could be on there, I guess, or to stabilize the surface of the particle. Um, I don't know if you can buy without really uh, all the ones that we look at have a ligand on the surface. But I think you want the ligand, right? Because then you have some control. Yeah, but okay. with the bird particle, then you have the metal or something like the surface. It's going to have some different property. There's always going to be some surface property that you have to take into consideration. So you just have to know what's on there. Yeah, because if there is no any surface treatment, well, in most of cases, it it would have the tangential anchoring. And we can simply get uh, this kind of homeotropic anchoring by treating with uh, surfactant. So it's more chance to well, have is, a different. This is just like the surfactant, right? The same kind of thing. Yeah. The same molecule, really. So it's not like you have to have any surface treatment to get the same
Now, we can relieve the elastic energy cast of that by the particles clustering together. So if you think about your liquid crystal and you have particles everywhere, cool into the matic phase, if the particles are able to group together, you'll be able to minimize the number of <coughs> defects. And that's exactly what we see. When you try to disperse the particles in the liquid crystal, you see if the concentration of them is enough, they'll deplete from a local area and cluster together. And it makes sense if they're able to find each other, they form just one defect, it's a big clump of particles. You can think of it as a kind of a coming out of the solution, but not a total phase separation. You know, they go to a defect. This is really um, what you think could be happening when you have your particles going to a defect. They just cluster in a low area region meaning they remove themselves from the liquid crystal, so we minimize the energy cost by clustering. Um, so, as we go through the phase transition, there's another effect that can also happen. So, first of all, we have the clustering. Secondly, as you go through phase transition, you're going to have domains of isotropic phase, which are gradually shrinking. We've also observed that the uh, nanoparticles prefer to remain in those isotropic domains. So this can be more like a phase separation effect as well. Nanoparticles love to be in the isotropic phase. They hate the nomadic phase. This bonds with this kind of surface anchoring. So they can be clustering, going to defects, and they also try to stay in the isotropic phase as long as possible. And I'll show some experimental results about that in a bit. So we found this is the two main interactions. We can summarize these kind of interactions with some big equations. The elastic contribution in the splay deformation is not good, so they form just one defect to minimize it. And then the thermodynamic effect, okay, they don't want to be in the nomadic phase, so they try to stay in the isotropic phase. There's another energy consideration we might need to worry about, and that could be Van der Waals attraction. So whenever you have a colloidal system, particles will come together and form irreversible phases. <coughs> okay. So they get close enough and they'll be strongly attracted to each other and like fall into this potential well. Okay. We found that this does not seem to be the case in these systems with the surface ligand. And we'll show you some results from that um, in a minute. But this could be that could happen. In the case of a particle with a very short ligand or maybe just a bare particle, this can be a serious problem. Because okay, once colloids get together and they can get close enough, they will come apart because they're a very small size. Okay. So now I'll show you some experimental results to think about the ideas I just presented. Um, so the first it's going to be just about what happens. Liquid crystal is not a good solvent for our nanoparticles. So we talked about the phase separation effect or the clustering effect. Um, so this is an image here. We can see some clusters. And I'll talk about these imaging techniques now. So we've been working with a lab that you've seen said, the Gosh lab, uh, doing imaging and spectroscopy on particles dispersed in liquid crystal. So what we have here is confocal photoluminescence microscopy. It's a setup where we look at the luminescence of quantum dots within a cell. So you have a liquid crystal cell, it's got the nanoparticles dispersed. We take an image of that cell, it's a confocal fluorescence microscopy image, and at each point in the image, we take the spectrum. So it's not just an intensity map, it's also a wavelength map of the sample. So this gives us information not just on the spatial arrangement of particles, but also on their emission properties. We can look at the emission wavelength, how it changes, depending if they're close to each other or far apart. You know, I mentioned the threat analysis, the transfer energy is going to change their emission properties. And we can also look at the fast lifetime behavior of the quantum dots. They transfer energy between each other, then that kind of interaction has a short lifetime compared to if they're on their own when they just 
absorb the photon, and then re-emit nanoseconds later. So using this setup, we can get quite a bit more out of the imaging and spectroscopy rather than just a, a basic um, microscopy image. So we can take a quick look at this. You see we've got the illuminating laser out of the sample. We scan with X, Y, and Z. Take an image. Each point in the image can take a spectrum and we can analyze with a lifetime measurement. So the two spectrometers connected here. One here for the image and this one for the lifetime measurement. Come back to this later on as well. Uh, the focal spot size of the sample is about one micron, uh, just limited by the focus of the objective. Um, and we can scan to the nano scanning stage. So we can scan around quite easily around the sample. And we can do different excitation wavelengths. Uh, particularly uh, 532 is a good one for us to use. The quantum lens have quite a broad um, absorption, but then they emit in a narrow range. So it's quite easy for us to excite the quantum dot in the secondary emission. And we can also do pulsed excitation for the ultra fast lifetime measurement. Okay. So here we can see an example. Each pixel, when we scan and collect an image in the CCD, each pixel has a spectrum associated with it. Then we can look at that spectrum and we can see what's the peak. Okay, see the maximum wavelength of emission. You can also do a lot more analysis on the, the spectral shade and so on, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Okay, so we talked about this uh, elastic effect that I mentioned before. The propensity to cluster, locally cluster. So you start off with particles everywhere in isotropic phase, you cool into the matic, and particles from nearby group together in a local cluster. Uh, here we can see photoluminescence intensity map of a small area. You can see some nice clusters. Okay. You can note here that actually quantum dots are everywhere. And this is a very low concentration. You know, this is about 0.05 to 1 weight percent. It's a very low concentration. We're certainly not loading them up super high. But they locally cluster. This is intensity map, so we can see that all here in these blobs. But there is quite a bit in the background as well. And these are ones that are lower down, so they're sort of out of, out of focus a little bit. That's why they look different. These ones are in the middle of the confocal. Now if you look at this map, we can see the wavelength map that goes with it, because each pixel on this image can give us a spectrum. So this map shows the peak of the emission of the quantum dots. And we can see something interesting. So first of all, it looks like, okay, these are the same, it's a big deal. But because this is wavelength map, not intensity, we can see in the center of the cluster, we have a lot of redshift. Okay, this is now, um, Look up table for wavelength, not intensity. So in the center of the cluster, it's really red shifted. That means that these quantum dots are close together and they're undergoing threat. Okay. The quantum dot transfers energy to a nearby one and then re-emits it, and there's an energy loss associated with that process, so it's a red shifted emission. And outside the clusters, we don't really have any red shift. Um, it's actually redshifted by about five nanometers. And first of all, we're thinking, well, it's a bag of bottles assembly, you know, it's permanently stuck together. But actually, this is not very big redshift. And the amount of redshift that you get can be characterized by how far apart the particles are. So by looking at this number, you can back out the separation of the quantum dots. And we can tell that they're not close enough to be permanently aggregated. So they are aggregated. If we heat back up to isotropic, they start to drift apart again. Why? So this is consistent with the idea that the ligands are more like interdigitated. The particles themselves are not so close that they'll never come apart. It's more like a, there's a thermal aspect to it. So if we heat them up, this change can release from each other, and the cluster will slowly start to disperse apart. And the kind of redshift that we get is consistent with that. We can also see it under the microscope. We can 
see that they gradually kind of diffuse out. Um, yeah. Another thing that we can do. So, do you know the reason why they are diffused out in the isotropic, the aggregation? Um, well, yes, because in the pneumatic phase, they want to form. A, so, they form the cluster to minimize the impact on the pneumatic phase. Yes. Right, so we don't want to have many small defects everywhere. They cluster together to create one defect, one deformation. Yes. So, it's lower energy cost. Yes. When you go back to isotropic, that removes the impact of that energy cost. So now it's just a thermal system. They get a jiggle around. Gradually, they just come apart. Oh, well, I... They're not attracted to each other anymore. Okay. The attraction comes purely from the elastic effects being a minimatic phase. So I, did, well, I don't know very well about the quantum dark, but usually in case of the some micrometer size, the colloidal particle, uh -huh. when they aggregate each other, even in the isotropy, usually they will not dispersed. So this particle is so, uh, very so, much smaller though. Yeah, so, so what's the difference? Well, thermal effects would be a lot larger, so just more particles. Because it's only a few nanometers in size. So, yeah, so I'm assuming for the large colloid, Basically, no, not much impacts the brain in motion. But in the tiny size, they move a lot due to thermal effects. Um, okay, now we had a good introduction on X-ray. I can just show you my results from an X-ray experiment where we did some scattering on these particles in the crystal. So in this experiment, we want to look at the structure of the clusters. Okay, so we have these in the capillary filled with its uh, liquid crystal with the clusters inside. And we wanted to know what's the structure of the clusters. We can get information from this energy transfer to tell us the average distance between particles. But we can also do a complementary experiment where we do x-ray. Okay, so here we can see some results. These experiments were done at the synchrotron that you just learned about. This is the Stanford synchrotron, uh, Stanford Radiation Laboratory in California. Um, so, when we do scattering on the system, we can see two traces here. The blue trace is liquid crystal only. And now also you're going to know how we get these curves from the same method that we just heard about. Uh, this is the scattering vector Q and intensity. Scattering intensity. Okay, so, we get rings and then we do the integration to get these 1D plots. For the liquid crystal only, we see here a peak. This is the pneumatic peak. So it's the distance between neighboring pneumatic molecules, just like you saw before. When we do the same sample with quantum dots, so with the clusters, now we can see a new peak forming. If the quantum dot was just dispersed, then we would not see any peak, because they would just be diluted and randomly arranged within the liquid crystal. But because we have clusters, now we see a peak here, and this peak can tell us, uh, if you like, the average distance between neighboring quantum dots. So it's telling us that within the cluster, there's a characteristic length scale of ordering. And so I have a little diagram here to kind of represent it. And so we think that the ligands really set the spacing. They give a <coughs> characteristic distance, um, and we measure from this peak, 7.6 nanometers between quantum dots. Uh, quantum dots are about 5 nanometers in size, plus ligand, so we definitely have some inter interdigitation of those ligands. Um, we can confirm the dispersion of the particles as well by heating. If we do this measurement and then we heat into the isotropic phase, then this peak goes away. So, but it takes some time. We can see initially it's still there, and then we do repeated scans. Eventually, the peak sort of goes away as the cluster disperses out. So it's another confirmation of that kind of idea. So this is a sort of a rough idea of what the structure should be like. Um, we also saw from our PL imaging something that correlates with this model. So if we take a 
look at one big cluster here, severely big one. This is a, also a wavelength image. You can see the redshift is approximately <coughs> the same all throughout the core. It's not getting denser and denser into the middle. So it looks like we have the particles randomly but close packed within the center of the cluster. And then on the outside, they start to get a little you know, further apart and a bit more random. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to show some, okay, a few more results and then that will be the end. Just a couple more minutes. Um, you know, I'm going to skip this because I'll talk more about that in the next talk. I just want to show these results. So I talked about the elastic effect and the thermodynamic effect. The elastic effect was the cluster one. Particles, when they're in the pneumatic phase, they just kind of group together and reduce, reduce the elastic cost. But another thing that we see when we go through the transition, which actually might be even more significant in terms of making a material, is that they just do not want to be in the pneumatic phase at all, if possible. So here we can see two series of a material that contains quantum dots and going to cool through the transition into the pneumatic phase. The top row here is just birefringence, and we're in a homeotropic cell, so we're not going to see a lot. In the bottom row here, you're only looking at quantum dots. That's the emission. Okay. So we can see when we start the isotropic phase, things are uniformly dispersed. Uh, it's a bit dark, but what we should hear, see here would be quantum dots are uniform okay, in the isotropic phase. Then as I cool through the transition, in the birefringence we can see pneumatic phase is coming in, but we leave behind islands of isotropic. What's happening is the spatial position of the quantum dots is very dynamic. They pretty much all move to the remainders of the isotropic phase. They don't want to be in the pneumatic phase as it comes in. And because the system has enough um, double energy, and they're very small, they're just able to move into the isotropic domains. So you can see they are mostly there. All this white here, this is quantum dots, and it matches really well with the remaining isotropic domains. Eventually, those domains close up, and as they close up, collect the quantum dot into a spot, the last place where this isotropic was, that's where the quantum dots end up. So I think when you're making the material, this is even more significant than the clustering effect, that they just, when the phase separate out. And so we can see here where the defects end up, that's where the cluster, quantum dot clusters end up as well. We can see a nice effect of this here, where we can try to control where they go as well. So here we've got some beads. We do the same thing again. Isotropic phase, picks up the dots, moves them into its domain. You can see where the beads are. Eventually, most of the quantum dots end up with the bead. It's like use a defect in nucleate where they end up. So we're tracking their progress. They end up in a, in a defect. Another interesting point here is, okay, this is remaining pneumatic phase now. Although these images only show quantum dots, pneumatic phase would be here. Uh, some quantum dots got left behind. Okay, you can see the paths that they tried to take to get out of the pneumatic phase. And where they got left behind, they're in clusters. So we can see this um, thermodynamic effect, and then if they didn't make it, they cluster, they use the elasticity effect to also minimize the interaction with the liquid crystal. Okay, so to finish up this bit, um, you're going to be hearing more from me after the break. Um, we'll talk about how quantum dots can be used to create hybrid materials, but it's really critical that we can understand how they interact with the material. And there's different effects that could go on. Um, if they don't want to be in the material that much, and that's something that you have to work hard to control, they could cluster, deplete from local areas because of elastic effects, or there could be more phase separation effects where you want to stay in the pneumatic phase. But that could even be used for patterning and films form some quite interesting effects. Okay. So after the break, I'll tell you more about some applications <coughs> from our lab. Thank you. Why is that form, uh, you said, it's closed random packing, but why is it not uh, 
uh, a crystal structure. Well, that's because of the surface. Uh, uh, everything's uh, very disordered. Actually, that would be very challenging to form. Nice if you have this particle of the same size and you have them initially, it should be Well, actually, so one thing could be that they are not really exactly the same size. Okay. Whenever you have a sample of nanoparticles, you're going to have quite a range of sizes. And that's why when you look at the emission peak, it can be fairly broad. It's not a single wavelength. So that can be one reason. Also, you can think of it um, kind of like a fractal aggregation type effect. You know, when particles come together in a cluster, they add and add and add to the cluster. So the way the cluster grows is not going to be in a perfect crystal. It'll add randomly. You can have vacancies in the cluster. You know, it grows very, in a very disordered way. In the form of a fractal structure, you have to have like sticky surface that once they are out there, you cannot move to a different Yeah, they so are somewhat sticky in terms of how the ligands interact. You can think of that a little bit sticky. When they form a cluster, you have to heat it up to get it to disperse. So I think of it a little bit like that cluster aggregation in the form, but not permanent. They can't rearrange and find a very low energy state, which would be a perfect crystal. That would be very difficult. My second question is, when you, when you go through the magnetic to isotopic phase transition, basically you will have a phase, uh, you have a boundary, which will have some surface tension, that uh -huh. is like a shrinking membrane, uh -huh. a shrinking elastic membrane. Uh -huh. Can we consider that the membrane collects all the beads yeah, and, and like puts them together? I have seen that uh, some bright vision on the boundary, and you could get this kind of effect, I've seen it, or even on a defect line, you know, the beads could be collected there. But, you know, in our images, we also see throughout the phase, you know, if you look here, we see a, some effect of that, but not totally. It also can be throughout the isotope. That's a good point. Yeah, so... Yeah, we can see, like, in this one here. As it's closing in as well, it's, like, pushing in, so... Yeah, hard to distinguish between the two effects. Yes? Yeah, so my question is also similar with his second question. Could you show me the previous feature? Yeah, so... This yes. one? Yeah, so here you the decrease the temperature from the isotropic to nematic. So in this case, because the nematic domain is domain, the size of the nematic domain increase, so this is why it might be now the quantum dub is in the preferred to be in the isotropic. But the, well, when you increase the temperature from the nematic to isotropic, is it still preferred to be in the isotropic? Uh, you... Because you said you the. Okay, so when you hit the sample from the nematic to isotropic. Yes. Oh, so you mean going backwards? Yeah, going backwards. Then the quantum dark still want to be in the isotropic phase because well, you, in your presentation you mentioned that they are always yeah, want so to be in the isotropic. Yeah, so when we do that, so we take the sample, say we have quantum dark cluster, yes. and then we reheat. After some time, you start to see halo around the cluster. So it's a much slower process. Coming apart is a much slower process than this formation process. Um, when we go from isotropic to pneumatic, they are pushed together to come into a cluster. But then when we reheat, they only diffuse out very slowly. So it doesn't really follow the domains of the phase growth at all. Um, when we reheat to isotropic, you start to see a diffuse halo around the cluster, and it gradually gets bigger. Imagine it just diffusing out. And that goes with the x-ray results, where we see it takes a while for this peak to disappear. It takes many minutes, when we do multiple scans, before this peak starts to disappear. So diffusing back out of the cluster is much more slow than this effect where we push them into the cluster. Okay, thank you. So it's definitely time for coffee. Maybe you can ask questions during the break. Okay.
<laughs> Coffee is here upstairs, so you all need to come up here and exit through this door.